Shalom and greetings, everybody. Brother Nicholas James Vanderlane. Today is the 14th day of the second month. So this is second Passover. It's May 3rd, 2019. This video is being broadcasted from Jerusalem, Israel. I apologize. I haven't got my camera for my laptop fixed yet. I should have my other laptop back on Monday. Uh, this video is titled 70 Years is Up. So we're in the 71st year right now. The 71st year is about to end on May 13th, the day before May 14th. That's the final day of the 71st year. So where is Elijah? So last May 13th, 2018 was the completion of the 70th year of the fig tree prophecy. This means that this is the 71st year of the fig tree and it's coming to a close in nine days on May 13th. May 14th will start the 72nd year. Several significant Bible, biblical events happened after the 70 years were completed and the number 70 represents fullness. Many people, including myself, consider the possibility of an event happening in this year following the 70 year completion. If this be a valid interpretation and application of the 70 years being applied to our time, then time appears to be running out. Yahweh Elohim is truly patient, long-suffering, and slow to anger, and rich in love. Chesed. The event many people anticipate to start during this 71st year, after the 70th year, is the Day of Yahweh. I believe the day of Yahweh is comprised of two segments of time. The first is the beginning of sorrows, which Messiah Yeshua pro prophesied about, I believe, in Luke 22, maybe Luke 24. I have to fact check that, where, he's, where, where they looked at among the temple and he said, what will be all the sign of thy coming and of the end of the age? So there's two parts there. And he said, all wars and rumors of wars is all the beginning of sorrows. So he gave two parts, sign of thy coming and then of the end of the age. So that's something that we should take a look at. And the second part of this beginning of sorrows, or of the day of Yahweh, is the 70th week of Daniel, which I understand right now to be a seven-year period, but it also could be a three-and-a-half-year period, which I'm starting to look into. So down here, if you can see it, this is the day of Yahweh. This is kind of like a timeline. You have the beginning of sorrows, which we don't know the time period on how long this, this lasts. And my guess right now, it's going to possibly be about two years, maybe two-and-a-half years. And then you have... The day of Yahweh, which is seven years or three and a half years. This is also called the 70th week of Daniel. So this being of sorrows plus the 70th week of Daniel equals the day of Yahweh. And there's a couple, there's a prophecy regarding this. That Malachi 4 verse 5. Behold, I will send you Eliyahu, Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahweh. So before the day of Yahweh is to come, we are supposed to have Elijah. Yeshua prophesied in Mark 9, verse 12, Eliyahu verily cometh first, and restoreth all things. So this was a prophecy, again, Yeshua confirming Malachi 4, 5, that Eliyahu is going to come and restore all things. So my question for everybody here watching, many Christians watch my channel, why would Elijah need to come to the earth before the day of Yahweh? when there are more Christians on the earth than ever before. There are more Bibles printed on the earth than ever before. We have the internet. We have Christian television. We have YouTube, which is filled with hundreds or thousands of Christian pastors and prophets and evangel evangelists. Why do we need Elijah? Obviously, something's broken. Considering we, have, we can be very well on the threshold of the day of Yahweh, I ask you a big question that I've asked myself. Where is Elijah? And no, don't tell me that the false prophet, Dr. Anwar, with his Range Rover fleet and his Mercedes Benz is, is the prophet Elijah. All you people are drinking that Kundalini Kool-Aid. That false spiritual wackiness. Not that having a Mercedes Benz or a Range Rovers is a bad thing. They're great vehicles. But from his position claiming to be this Elijah type person, you know, uh, going out and flaunting all this wealth and brand new suits and going on stage and having all these cars, it's a complete farce and it's more that TBN false Christian spirit. In this video, I'm going to lay out the types of John the Baptist, Elijah, and Elisha so we can properly recognize Elijah when he comes. The fact that Elijah appeared in the same state as Moses who had died on the Mount of Transfiguration, I imagine Elijah to either have died or been translated, leaving this earth and dimension. I don't think he's going to go back into a body of flesh like this 
So I don't believe that's the case. I also don't believe that Elijah is one of the two witnesses. I believe I've identified those to be John and Daniel. I have a three-part series, and I can even add more. I've had more findings that just support the idea that it's going to be John and Daniel. They're the two lampstands that have stood in the... Both of them had visions in the temple, John the Revela uh, Revelator and Daniel the prophet. So both were in the throne room and had visions in the throne room. So that means that they stood before the throne as prophesied by Zechariah. Both uh, were told that they were going to, you know, read the last verse of Daniel and you'll see that he has a, a more, another job to do and stand in his lot at the end of the days. And then same with John, he was going to be have to prophesy again. And there's just so many types. Eldad and Medad both had the insight into the time periods of the of the final 42 months or seven year period. So let's get on with this. Eliahu was a Tishbite of the sojourners of Gilead in 1 Kings 17 verse 1. This means that he was not a native Israelite. So he was not an Israelite. He was of another race. He had a cloak, which is called them his mantle, and he also had a leather girdle. In the book of James, in chapter 5, verse 17 through 18, writing about Eliyahu, Eliyahu was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth for a space of three years and six months, three and a half years. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Romans 11, uh, verse 2 to 3, And Elohim has not cast away his people which he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture saith of Elijah, how he maketh intercession to Elohim against Israel, saying, Yahweh, they have killed thy prophets and digged down thine altars, and I alone left him alone, and they seek my life. So Elijah was a man just as we are. He had the same temptations of the flesh, of uh, you know, or uh, I guess uh, we tempt ourselves. So he had the same testings of the flesh and of pride, just as us, and maybe even more so considering his position. He was a man of prayer and he was the only one prophet remaining. Also important to note that Elijah called on the name of Yahweh, not Lord. A prophet of Yahweh will only use the name, Yahweh's name. So, Elisha, which was Elijah's successor. Elisha was the son of Shaphat of Abel Mahola. And this area right here was in the land of Issachar. Okay, so he was of the tribe of Issachar. He inherited Elijah's mantle, his cloak. And it turns out that I believe that Elisha also had a staff. When Elisha was elected to be Elijah's successor, Elisha was a regular man with a regular business slash job. He had 24 oxen, which is a sizable amount of oxen if you can think about that. And he had a field which he was plowing. So he had some property, it looks like, in a business. And, and he liked labor because he had his hand on the plow. And he had, so that 12, 24 oxen is 12 yoke of oxen, and he was working with the 12th yoke, okay? The final yoke of oxen is he was working with, and when he was uh, tapped or the mantle was thrown on him by Elijah, uh, I believe he sacrificed the animals, with, sacrificing, when anytime you kill an animal, basically it's like a sacrifice, basically. And he boiled the flesh for the people to eat. And as I've talked about this, the only way that we are, in the biblical way, to eat flesh of, of beasts or of, of, of beasts and possibly of fowls, I believe, is to boil it. It's to seethe it, to get out the myoglobin, okay? The blood uh, is, is not, and I did a study on this, and this is a grave sin. And the video that I made on this only has 1,600 views. But everybody wants to watch my videos on when is the rapture. But no one wants this holy instruction on living a holy life unto Yahweh Elohim about not eating the blood that's in the meat. It's a grave sin. And the, almost basically everybody in the world that eats meat is eating the blood. Because the only way to eat the flesh is to first boil it to remove out the myoglobin. Okay. And any extra blood that's in it. But particularly the myoglobin, and this is the only biblical way to eat the flesh. The only time you can eat roasted flesh is on Pesach, on Passover. So Elijah threw his mantle on him to appoint him as his successor, but didn't. But Elisha didn't receive the power, the double portion spirit of Elijah, until he saw Elijah go up into the whirlwind. That's something to note and to think about. Elisha's second miracle was to curse the mocking youth in the name of Yahweh. And when he did this, two she-bears were summoned, which came out of the forest. 
killed 42 of the youth, just as the two witnesses and Daniel will come to the earth and destroy with plagues and no rain for 42 months. There are many more types of prophecies of Elijah and Elisha, which will probably be fulfilled again in some sort of type during the day of Yahweh. That's in the future. Don't know for sure. It's my best understanding. So besides Elijah and Elisha, okay, both of those, both of their works are very important. John the Baptist is another Elijah type, and he came in the spirit of Elijah, as Yeshua said, we'll get into that scripture. John was a Zadok priest. His father served, served in the temple, and he was of the tribe of Levi. John ate locust and wild honey, so he ate clean. And he didn't drink wine or strong drink, according to Luke chapter 1, verse 15. He was filled with the Ruach HaKodesh from birth. He wore camel's wool, camel's hair, which is like a woven fra a a fabric. They have it in Egypt. They still use camel's hair. It's very popular in Egypt. It's like a wool. And he also had a leather girdle, maybe similar to, if not, Elijah's leather girdle and possibly mantle. We don't know. Didn't give us that information, but he had a leather girdle just like Elijah did. Yeshua called John the Baptist the greatest of the prophets to date. In Luke chapter 7, verse 28, For I say unto you, among those that are born of woman, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of Elohim is greater than he. John, verses 10 through 40 to 42. And Yeshua, when he went away again beyond the Jordan into the place where John at first baptized, and there he abode, and many resorted unto Yeshua, him, and said, John did no miracle, but the things that John spoke of this man, of Yeshua, were true. And many believed on him there. Where? Probably Qumran. But notice that John did no miracle. So unlike Elijah and Elisha, who did many, many miracles, many miracles, amazing miracles, John did no miracles, but he spoke truth. And that is what was one of the distinctions of John. He spoke truth, and it's truth regarding Yeshua HaMashiach. John identified, revealed, made the formal declaration to Judah and Israel that Yeshua was the Messiah, the Lamb of Elohim that takes away the sin of the world. Upon Messiah Yeshua's official ministry, John knew his position in the ministry of Yahweh would diminish and that Messiah Yeshua must magnify and that he would decrease and become less. John was also accused of having a demon, Alan Horvath. So, despite being the greatest of the prophets, John didn't have a full and perfect understanding of the prophetic scriptures. Yes, John was very familiar with them, but he found himself imprisoned, about to be beheaded, when he sent two messengers to his cousin, Yeshua, whom he immersed, and he heard the voice of Yahweh was heard, and also saw the uh, spirit of Yahweh open up and descend like a dove upon Yeshua, asking Yeshua if he was the Messiah or not, because, he did, because John obviously didn't understand the things that were happening to him, and thought that the kingdom was going to be restored, but he found himself, like I said, imprisoned, about to be beheaded. So John didn't have a perfect understanding, and so I say, if John didn't have a perfect understanding of the end times, I say, any who do, who claim, and I get it all the time on YouTube, you know, that, that they're so dogmatic about their understanding, it's so perfect, they have the pride, and that pride needs to be dealt with. And I reject that. I reject those people who think that they are know-it-alls, in time know-it-alls, it's pride. When John was questioned by the religious leaders and people regarding his identity, whether he was Elijah, John denied being Elijah because he wasn't. And instead he identifies himself saying, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of Yahweh. John chapter 1, 19 through 23. And this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elijah? And he said, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou? of thyself. And John said, he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of Yahweh, as said the prophet Isaiah. 
So Isaiah prophesied of this Elijah type that were, was to come. And we will take a look at the, another prophecy possibly in, in Isaiah, possibly regarding the end time Elijah type. The message of the straight path is the Ten Commandments. So John was a preacher of the Ten Commandments. This is the straight path. Yeshua clearly identifies John as coming in the spirit of Elijah in Matthew 11, verse 13 to 14, for all the prophets in the law prophesied until John, and if you will receive it, this is Elijah, which was for to come. So Yeshua identified John as being the Elijah to come, and even though John denied being Elijah, he said, I am not, right? And But again, what was his message? His message was to make the straight path, which is the Ten Commandments. So he was preaching the Ten Commandments. John the Baptist was more than a prophet. Okay, He was the greatest prophet, yes, but he was more than a prophet. Yeshua clearly identified John as coming in the spirit of Elijah, which we just read. And then here in Luke chapter 7, verses 24 through 35. And when the messengers of John were departed, he began... He began to speak to them, Yeshua, okay, these are the messengers that John sent to Yeshua. He began to speak unto the people concerning John. And this is Yeshua talking. He said to the people, What went you out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken in the wind? Nope, because John wasn't shaken. He was steadfast. But what went ye out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Nope. Behold, they which are gorgeously appareled, and live delicately, or in king's courts. But what went she out to see? A prophet? Yea. So Yeshua is identifying me as a prophet. I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. So he was not only a prophet, but much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of Elohim is greater than he. And all the people that heard John and the publicans and justified Elohim being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers, the religious leaders, the scribes, rejected the counsel of Elohim against themselves, not being baptized of him. And the master said, Whereunto shall I liken this, the men of this generation? And to what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another, saying, we have piped unto you, and you have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and you have not wept. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye say, He hath a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and ye say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. And we're going to take a look at what wisdom is. It's justified of her children. What was the mission of John, and what is the mission and timing of the second of this second Elijah Elisha type? Luke chapter one through sixteen through seventeen. This is the prophecy regarding what would happen, what would be of John, by given by the angel Gabriel. And many of the children of Israel shall he, John the Baptist, turn to Yahweh their Elohim, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Eliyahu, to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for Yahweh. So what do you mean turning the disobedient to the wisdom of the just? Well, the beginning in Proverbs, the beginning of wisdom, the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom. So he's going to turn the people back to fear. And this is the eternal gospel that is preached in Revelation chapter 14. The first two words of that messenger that preaches is fear Elohim. The second is give glory to him. But the first two words are fear Elohim. Okay, fear is the beginning of wisdom. Fear is the beginning of understanding. Without fear, it's a false conversion. Okay, we're called to fear Yahweh Elohim. Once we fear him, the penalty that's due us, right, then we can love him for what he did, and then we can reverence him out of thankfulness for what he did and do what he says for us to do. Turning the hearts of the fathers to the children, we'll get into that in a little bit. This prophecy, okay, as I said, was given by Gabriel regarding John's mission. We see the same mission in the prophecy of Malachi regarding the second Elijah type that comes at the end before the day of Yahweh. So, as was the first Elijah type, we see this, the second Elijah type before the day of Yahweh. 
Malachi 4 verses 1 through 6. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all the wicked do wickedly, but shall be, shall be stubble. And the day sh that shall cometh shall burn them up, saith Yahweh of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch, but unto you that fear, okay, fear my name, shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall, and ye shall tread down the wicked. And they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith Yahweh of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him unto him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. Okay, so the whole shebang. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahweh. And what? And here it is right here. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with the curse. So what does this mean, turn the hearts of the children to the fathers? Well, this is because there is a generational curse to the third and fourth generation of those that hate Yahweh Elohim. And this is found within the Ten Commandments. So inside the Ten Commandments, there's a generational curse. I've talked about this. I've preached about this in my videos. Okay, we see it right here in Exodus chapter 20, verse uh, 4 through 6. This is after the third commandment of idolatry. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to those idols, nor serve them. For I am Yahweh thy Elohim, am a jealous Elohim, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto the thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Guard my commandments. Guard my mitzvah. So this was spoken out of Yahweh Elohim's own mouth on Mount Sinai and written with Yahweh Elohim's own finger, probably the fingers of Yeshua HaMashiach, and given on tablets to Moses. And what's important about, the, about this is that he said there's only thousands of them that love him. Well, there was over, there's almost like 2 million total people between men, male and female and children at Mount Sinai when this law was given. At least a million males, I believe. So, with that, or about. So with that being said, of the million, only thousands, not tens of thousands, only thousands of them that love him. So there was generational curses on them that hate me. That means the majority of them hated him. And at that time, they feared him because, as I said in my previous video, in Deuteronomy, Yahweh Elohim actually, when he was giving the law to Moses the second time, he actually commends the Israelites for the fear that they had when they heard the voice of Elohim given the Ten Commandments because when Yahweh Elohim spoke, they were fearful that they were going to die. They said, Moses, don't let Yahweh Elohim speak with us. You speak with us. Don't let Yahweh Elohim speak with us lest we die because they heard the commandments. They heard the voice of Yahweh and they were fearful of him. And Yahweh commended the Israelites for that fear. Hallelujah. That's the type of fear we're supposed to have. Think about the judgment that's on our soul. That's what quickens us, gives us the fear of Elohim, causes us to turn from our sin and receive the forgiveness of sins through Yeshua HaMashiach and the blood of Yeshua HaMashiach that covers and takes away our sin, okay? Not only was he the Passover sacrifice, but he was also the atoning sacrifice. As I explained, Yeshua died the day after Passover on the 15th day of the first month, which was the Passover of the Jews, but really on the true Zadok priest calendar, it was the first day of, the, uh, of unleavened bread, the same day Israel came out of Egypt. And we know that atonement was made on the second Passover, and that was a, for, a type of what Yeshua did. Not only did he was the Passover lamb, but he was the atonement, kippurim, sacrifice to kippur, to cover our sin and to take the sin away completely. So we see that, again, that this is a very serious thing. In Numbers 14 through 18, Yahweh's long-suffering and great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Me and my house, my house, the house of Nicholas James Vanderlyn, I've broken this curse, this generational curse, which happens, how? By making teshuva and receiving the blood of Yeshua HaMashiach. And now I guard the Ten Commandments because that's what we're all supposed to do. Keep the Ten Commandments as best as we can and love the Ten Commandments because they are the way of life. As I explained in my previous video, Proverbs chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Okay, keep my commandments and live. Okay, keep them as the apple of thy eye. This is life. So, turning the hearts of the fathers to their children means 
that this person will be preaching repentance and a return to the Ten Commandments and then the statutes and the judgments, okay? Because the Torah is good. It's instruction for a life. Not wearing mixed fibers is a good thing. It's healthy living. Not eating blood, it's healthy. It's good. Not eating unclean animals, it's healthy. It's good living. The Torah, the instruction, the statutes, the judgments, they're good. The sacrificial system has been done away with. It says in Psalm 34 verse 8, Taste and see, Yahweh is good. What taste and see, well, that's that's experience, right? If you look at if you're going shopping for food, you look at the food in the market, wow, this looks good, and then you taste it to see if it's as good as it looks, and it is with Yahweh Elohim. So all of the law and the prophets hang on the Ten Commandments. They say, well, Good teacher, what is the greatest commandment? You should have gave them two. Love Yahweh Elohim with all your heart. Mind, soul, and strength. That's the first four commandments. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the next six commandments. And then Yeshua said, all those two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. So all the law and prophets is fulfilled in those two commandments, which is a summary of the 10, which is a summary of the 613. There's no reason, you know, if you keep this. Paul said, circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of Elohim is everything. Circumcision is of the law of Moses. Circumcision is not required for salvation. It's a good thing, though, to be circumcised because infection for both male and female. Uh, the male can pass on an infection to the female if he doesn't keep his foreskin clean. So circumcision is good. You know, the law of Moses is good. Now, those things aren't required for salvation, but when you taste and see that Yahweh is good, you'll realize that all of his law is good and applicable for lives of living Holy Kodesh lives set apart to Yahweh Elohim. His feast days, feasts of Yahweh, are part of, of the law of Moses. So very good. The prophecies of the end times, Elijah. Yeshua identifies John the Baptist as the Elijah type and prophesies a second Elijah type to come, it appears. Mark 9, verse 11 to 13. And they ask Yeshua, saying, Why say the scribes that Elijah must first come? And he, Yeshua, answered and told them, Elijah verily cometh first and restoreth all things. How it is written of the Son of Man, that he must suffer many things, and be said it not. But I say unto you, that Elijah is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed, as it is written of him. So Elijah verily cometh first. Is future tense a prophecy? Why would Elijah need to come and restore all things when, like I said previously, Christianity is at an all-time high. This is the age of Christianity. We've been in the decades, the centuries of Christianity. Why does Elijah need to come? Something must be tr tremendously broken. Luke chapter 4, verse 24 through 27, And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you a truth. Many widows were in Israel in the last days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elijah sent, save to Sapphira, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. So really, during the time of these people, there's a lot of unbelief going on, obviously. So, yes, Yeshua prophesied of himself as a type of the fulfillment of Elijah and Elisha, which Yeshua was and will not be received. But my question is, did he also prophesy of a three and a half year term for the coming Elijah type? Possibly. Who knows? What are the list of things that need to be restored? So there are pure language, I think, in Malachi 3 needs to be restored. My guess is that Daniel or John Possibly Daniel will be, will be the one that will restore that. Could be Elijah type. The calendar of Yahweh, the Zadok priest solar calendar, that has been restored. I've been working on some restoration on that on my channel. Other people out there have restored many parts of it as well. Also kept the same calendar. Hallelujah by the Ruach HaKodesh gave me a bunch of insight regarding the 365th day and the proper way to calibrate the calendar to make sure that we have the seasons and in, in, in in the correct Sabbath and everything else. The identity of Israel will be one of the restoration works of this end time Elijah type. And he will restore the wisdom of the just, which we read about, which is the fear of Yahweh Elohim. Like I said, I believe that this, the messenger in maybe in Revelation chapter 14 
it's translated as angel, but it's a messenger, and he preaches it through the air. So he'll probably send out probably like a video transmission via YouTube video, which is sent transmission through the airwaves, preaching the everlasting gospel, which is fear Elohim and give glory to him. And then the return of the 10 plus 1 commandments. The plus 1 commandment is to love the brethren that Yeshua gave. He gave us a new commandment, an additional commandment to love the brethren. And then you have the 10 commandments. And then also the Torah, which is the instruction. It's instruction for life. That's what the law of Moses is, instruction for life, for living a healthy, vibrant life to Yahweh Elohim. Holy, Kodesh, set apart life, right? Not working on the, new, the days of the new months. Not working on the, day, the, the feast days that are Kodesh, that are high Sabbaths, I guess you would call them. Not working on the Sabbaths, doing those things. And then finally right here, we have a prophecy of Elijah. This is found in the book of Sirach or Ecclesiasticus. This is not in the modern canon, but this used to be in the 1611 King James, and this was found in Qumran among the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this is attributed to Ben Sirach, which was a writings that were probably 200 years prior to Yeshua HaMashiach. That's what some scholars put at, but maybe it was longer, like 400. I don't know. This is chapter 49, verse 1 through 11. The same wisdom that's found in Sirach, you can find it in Proverbs. Hallelujah. You know, from the same rock. Then stood up Elijah, the prophet, as fire, and his word burned like a lamp. So he had the zeal, okay, of the word of Yahweh. And he brought in truth, a zeal for truth, just like John the Baptist. Truth. He preached truth, okay? He brought a sore famine upon them, and by his zeal he diminished their number. By the word of Yahweh, he shut up the heaven and also three times brought down fire. O Eliyahu, how wast thou honored in thy wondrous deeds? And who made glory like unto thee? Who didst raise up a dead man from death and his soul from the place of the dead? By the word of the Most High, who brought us kings to destruction and honorable men from their bed, who heardest the rebuke of Yahweh in Sinai and in Horeb the judgment of vengeance? who anointest kings to take rev revenge and prophets to succeed him, who was taken up in a whirlwind of fire and in a chariot of fiery horses, who was ordained for reproofs in their times to pacify the wrath of Yahweh's judgment before it break forth into fury and to turn the heart of the Father unto the Son and to restore the tribes of Jacob Blessed are they that saw thee and slept in love, for we shall surely live. So this is a hidden prophecy regarding Eliyahu. And we can see that Elijah re did reproofs. He pacified the wrath of Yahweh's judgment before it break forth into fury. He turned the hearts of the Father to the Son, which is preaching repentance returning to the Ten Commandments, breaking the generational curse on your children, on your sons, on your sons' sons, on your sons' sons' sons, to the third and fourth generation. When you make Teshuva, you keep the commandments and you break that curse. Okay, your heart is turned toward your children because you're now a doer of the word, not a hearer only, deceiving your own selves. And then... Finally, this is the prophecy that he will restore the tribes of Jacob. Hallelujah. That's going to be a doozy. Okay. Um, so, when will this Elijah type come? I imagine he'll be here on earth prior, before the day of Yahweh, as Yeshua prophesied, as in Malachi prophesied, before the day of Yahweh. And I suspect that his ministry... Uh, some probably, my guess is that his ministry will receive the double portion spirit of Eliyahu if he does. And that won't commence until this rapture, birth of the man-child, or the Zakar one that remember once happened. Unless this person does no miracles, like John did no miracles. I suspect that this Elijah-type person to be the messenger to Ephraim prophesied about in Isaiah 28. We're going to be taking a look at Isaiah 28 next. Just as John the Baptist, remember he said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of Yahweh, as said by, as prophesied by Isaiah. Because not only it's the Ten Commandments, his message will be an emphasis also on returning to the seventh-day Sabbath, the same message that Yeshua HaMashiach taught. 
as well as the this person will also possibly be the Ezekiel 33 watchman. And I believe also he'll be the one who counts the number of the beast, the number of the man, which is 666. And also could be and possibly is that messenger in Revelation chapter 14 that will then preach the eternal gospel, which is fear Elohim. I always thought that that was a messenger that flies around the world, preaching it through the air. But I think it's probably going to be a YouTube broadcast, right, saying fear Elohim. And the word messenger and angel could be synonymous. Here is Isaiah 28. I did a message on this way back when, probably longer than six months ago, maybe nine months ago. The Isaiah 28 messenger to Ephraim. We're going to go through Isaiah 28 verses 1 through 13 because it will break down what's going on here. Woe to the crown of pride. The drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys that are overcome with wine. Behold, Yahweh has a mighty one, a strong one, which has a tempest of a hail, destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. The crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, shall be trodden down under feet, and the glorious beauty, which is on the head of the fat valley, shall be a fading flower, as the hasty uh, fruit before the summer. Which when he looked upon it, seeth it, while it is yet in his hand, he eateth it up. In that day, Yahweh of hosts shall be a crown of glory, and a diadem of beauty for the residue of his people, and for a spirit of judgment to him that sits in judgment, and for the strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. But they have also erred through wine, and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. I believe that'd be the petrodollars they say they're rich but they are poor and blind and naked you can read about all of my commentary here in the red they're out of the way through strong drink they err in vision we see this on youtube all the christian prophets out there the rapture prophets they stumble in judgment modern christianity they don't know true judgment for all their tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there's no place clean modern christianity is an unclean unholy lawless religion Okay, whom shall he teach knowledge? Okay, now remember, the fear of Yahweh is also the beginning of knowledge. And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. So here we go. Here, here's how we can recognize the Isaiah 28 messenger message. Right here in this pretty magenta. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line, line upon line. Here a little and there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to this people. So, count this with me, people. Precept upon precept, one, two. Precept upon precept, four. Line upon line, six. Line upon line, eight. Here a little, nine. There a little, ten. He'll be preaching the Ten Commandments with stammering lips. That means he'll have a stammer. He won't be a great public speaker. He'll be tripping over his words. Uh, Moses had a stammer. Paul had a stammer. And he'll be speaking with another tongue. So he'll probably be speaking in another language other than the Hebrew. Okay? He will speak to this people. Okay? And what is he going to say? To whom he said, This is the rest that ye may cause the weary to rest. What is this rest? Well, we are supposed to rest on the Sabbath. So he'll not only be preaching the Ten Commandments, but he'll be saying, Rest on the Sabbath day. And this is the refreshing. Yet the people won't hear him. They will not hear this messenger. This messenger will be preaching the Sabbath, yet they will not hear. But the word of Yahweh was unto them. Unto who? Unto the people. Precept upon precept. Two. Precept upon precept. Four. Line upon line. Six. Line upon line. Eight. Here a little and there a little. Nine and ten. Okay. Ten commandments. Repeat it twice. That they might go and fall backward and be broken. Which means they're going to make teshuva and snared and taken be taken in this rapture possibly taken the the safe place who knows right but they didn't okay this is not what they wanted to do and so getting back to this rest which caused the weary to rest we find let me talk expound upon this rest that yeshua preached about also jeremiah preached about okay yeshua wanted us to return to the ten commandments it's all he preached about was the ten commandments and he preached on the Sabbath. Everybody goes to my thing. No, Yeshua broke the Sabbath. The Pharisees said he broke the Sabbath. Yeshua is the master of the Sabbath. You don't think that 
He knew how to keep the Sabbath here. And yeah, he worked on the Sabbath. But even the priests in the temple work on the Sabbath, okay? So let's not get all legalistic trying to trying to say what's what's right and wrong on the Sabbath. Yeshua taught it's good to do good on the Sabbath. What did he heal, do on the Sabbath? Did he cook on the Sabbath? No. When the disciples walked through the field, they plucked the grains and they ate them. They didn't roast the grains in fire. He didn't build a fire and eat roasted grains. They ate the heads of grain right there as they walked through. He did good on the Sabbath. He healed on the Sabbath. He brought life on the Sabbath. Okay, He saved life on the Sabbath. He restored life on the Sabbath. He, re he did restoration on the Sabbath. So Yeshua didn't break the Sabbath. He kept it. He kept the Torah perfectly. He fulfilled all of the Torah. He's the living instruction. He showed us how to do these things. He showed us how to keep the Sabbath, how to live the Sabbath. With that being said, let's get back to Jeremiah 6, verse 16. Thus saith Yahweh, Stand ye in the ways, and seek, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. There's always been something about keeping the Sabbath. The Sabbath in Exodus is mentioned to be a sign of Yahweh Elohim, the sign of the people. Yet people, that's the first thing that people want to break is the Sabbath. There is grace. There is a time period. The Sabbath wasn't instituted for Israel officially for like four there was four sabbaths after they passed through the red sea the sabbath wasn't instituted for like four four weeks four sabbaths there was time that was given to the israelites to adjust coming out of egypt and keeping yahweh's law okay so there's grace there right there's there's time and yahweh that's working out our salvation and fear and trembling there's a process of doing this there's a sanctification process as we learn and are exposed to it we're supposed to do it there's a lot of people out there that are righteous that have never heard this teaching, yet they still fear Yahweh Elohim. But when you hear this message, if you don't receive it, what does it say about you? If you don't aren't a doer of the word, what does it say about you? That's between you and Yahweh Elohim. But there's people that willfully reject it. Like it said, my people perish for a lack of knowledge because thou willfully rejected knowledge. Okay, when they're told about keeping the Sabbath, he's going to willfully reject knowledge. Okay, that's just part of it. There's a willful rejection of Yahweh Elohim. There's a false gospel message of hyper grace that has gone out. Satan's gone out, deceived the whole world, all men's religions, and yes, he's deceived Christianity. Most scariest place to be deceived in. If we're going to look at the old path in the good way, but this rest for your souls. You see it that you may cause the weary to rest. Rest, okay, the refreshing. Yeshua said to them, he preached, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm leak and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for unto your souls. Okay, remember he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Okay, Ten Commandments, that's it. It's easy and light. Loving Elohim with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, loving your neighbor and yourself. That's a light and yoke thing. That's, that's not this sacrificial system that was crazy hard to keep with. Um... This is, yoke is easy and burden is light. Keeping the Ten Commandments and learn from Him because He is meek and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest for your souls. This word soul in the Hebrew is nefesh. This is literal your soul, like soul food. Like when you eat a good meal, oh, that was delicious. It just does something to your inside of your soul. How do you else do you find rest for your soul? The literal rest of the Sabbath here on earth. Working six days and taking the seventh day off. Working a month and taking off the, 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 the festival of the new month, the first day of the month. Taking off the Kodesh holy days that he has said that are, are high Sabbaths, right? The first day of unleavened bread, the seventh day of unleavened bread, Shavuot, Yom Kippur is another one. The first day of Sukkot and the eighth day of Sukkot. So with that being said, those are the holidays, you know, he is good. That work schedule that he gives is better than any work schedule of Babylon, and it is good. And these are appointed times. These are meeting times where he meets with us, where we worship him. The rest for your soul is the literal rest of the seventh-day Sabbath, which is a part of the Ten Commandments as right here in the Messenger of Isaiah 28. This is the rest where you may cause a weary to rest. The Ten Commandments, this is refreshing, but they people would not hear. So the seventh-day Sabbath this year is on the Gregorian Sunday, as I've proven in my calendar. The things that I do is not just for you to hear. It's not a song and dance. This is for life, for us to live out, to live holy lives under Yahweh Elohim. Last year, the, Gregori the Sabbath was on the Gregorian Saturday. So it was the same as the world Sabbath. So the Sabbath changes, has a different Gregorian equivalent every year. Just like similar how your birthday is on a different Gregorian day of the week every year. 
And I'm not promoting birthday celebrations because birthday celebrations are pagan and wicked and evil. And we see that, that there's no such thing as a good birthday celebration in the scriptures. When Yeshua came, yes, they, the, 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 the Magi, the, the men from the east, brought gifts to Yeshua for his birth, but not to celebrate a birthday. Job cursed his birthday and had it removed from the reckoning of the year, as I've proven out on Elohim's calendar, as I brought some re re more restoration, completely restore that calendar, the understanding, the biblical understanding of that calendar. Hallelujah, I'll praise the Most High, who, get, who the Ruach gave me the wisdom and understanding to do it. So Ezekiel 33, so this is the messenger of the messenger, the watchman here, explanation of Jerusalem's fall. And the word of Yahweh was saying unto me, Son of man, they inhabit those the waste of land of Israel speak, saying, Abraham, they say, Abraham was one, and he inherited the land, but we are many. And the land was given for us for an inheritance. Wherefore, say unto them, okay, these are people that are claiming to be many here in the land of Israel. These might be non-true Judah uh, Israelites, okay? False Israel. Yeshua prophesied that they, th those that say they are Jews, but are not. So they are probably not genetic Israelites. We know that many of them aren't. Wherefore say unto them, Thus saith Yahweh Elohim, Ye eat with the blood, and ye lift up your eyes toward your idols, and shed blood, and shall ye possess the land? Blood, the number one offense is eating with the blood. Here I did a video fully explaining and breaking down how people eat with the blood to this day. Anyone who eats meat, flesh, is eating with the blood unless it's been boiled out. The only biblical way to eat flesh is by boiling out the myoglobin. The blood protein that gives the color the, the flesh, and that Israel is doing that to this day. The second is their eye, they lift up their eyes to their idols. What are their idols today? They're rabbis. They worship these men. They put them over the Most High El, and they shed blood. They use excessive force. Shall they possess the land? That ye stand upon the sword. That's excessive force. Ye work abomination, and everyone devile the vile is neighbor's wife you can devile your neighbor's wife by thinking adulterous thoughts about your neighbor so they're breaking the commandments shall ye possess the land and so we can go into it but i basically broke down the message of the ezekiel 33 watchman here gave you guys complete foolproof insight on how people eat with the blood to this day israel's eating with the blood we've done it ignorantly turn from this learn how to live a kodesh life how to properly remove the blood. I explain it all in this ver in this video right here. But this is what brings the judgment, the coming judgment to Jerusalem. Is This is the first offense. This is the second offense. The third offense is shedding blood, which is murder. That's the breaking of the commandment. And they deviling their neighbor's wife. Again, adultery, breaking the commandments. Lastly, it says in Revelation, I don't have it in front of me. It says, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding, count the number of the beast, for is the number of the man, and the number is 666. It says he, that particular person, someone will be able to count the number of the beast, it's the number of the man, number 666. I have shared in my video, Brother Scott Dreyer, for 20 years, over 20 years, has identified Bashar al-Assad as the uh, beast as the as the, the Assyrian Antichrist, I should say. Bashar al-Assad's father, his last name, his grandfather's name was Al-Wahash, which is translated the beast, and his grandfather changed the name to Al-Assad, which is the lion. He is the Assyrian, literally the Assyrian from Assyria, the lion from the north in Jeremiah chapter 4 and 5 and 6, which comes from the north down on Israel and on Jerusalem right here. But it is Bashar al-Assad. And the Ruach HaKodesh, about or nine months ago, gave me the wisdom and understanding to count Bashar al Hafez al-Assad in the Hebrew to equal 666. There's just two small tweaks that you have to do. Convert it to the Hebrew. Remove the word al, which still keeps intact his name. And then add two alephs, which will give you the, the Hebrew Grammatria number of 666. So... This is my best understanding of this, brothers and sisters. Where is Elijah? We, we where will when he comes? We'll, where? How will we know? It says again back here. Blessed are they that saw thee and slept in love, for we shall surely live. And this person will restore the tribes of Jacob. I don't have the full understanding of who the tribes of Jacob are. 
I've narrowed it down to four or five groups of people, different types of people, four groupings of people. I have yet to have the wisdom and understanding to understand who the tribes of Jacob are. But when Elijah comes, this is one of the works that he will do. So I'm signing off, brothers and sisters. Hopefully you're blessed by this message. Hallelujah. And uh, I'm signing off here from Jerusalem, Israel. Uh, We have a high watch tonight. And shalom.